Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Krishna Reddy from Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Reddy is currently working as an orthopedic surgeon at the Cincinnati VA Medical Center and assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics at the University of Cincinnati. He specializes in musculoskeletal oncology, sports medicine, shoulder reconstruction, and general orthopedics, including primary and revision orthoplast. He graduated from orthopedic residency in one of the top medical schools in India before moving to the United Kingdom on a British Council sponsorship. He's a fellow of the prestigious Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And subsequently, he underwent musculoskeletal oncology training at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Birmingham, India. Later, Krishna moved to the Vanderbilt University in 2014, where he pursued another year of fellowship. And subsequently, he did another sports medicine fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. His numerous international presentations and publications in peer-reviewed journals with over 250 citations. If you've noted, Dr. Reddy has previously lectured on a channel, and today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Krishna Reddy for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Krishna. Thank you, Hitesh, once again for your kind words. Uh, Hitesh is a dear friend of mine. Um, so with that uh, introduction, I don't think he's left anything for me to add. Uh, as Hitesh said, I did my initial uh, orthopedic oncology training at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital uh, in the UK. I was in the UK for about 12 years and I did two years post FRCS orthopedic uh, fellowship uh, at ROH. And ROH is one of the largest uh, volume tumor centers um, in the world. From the ROH, my journey took me to the Vanderbilt Medical Center in, in the US. This is in Nashville. It's a huge medical center compared to the ROH. And this is where I did an additional year of musculoskeletal oncology fellowship and then came to Cincinnati. So this is University of Cincinnati Medical Center. This is my workplace. This is where I did my fellowship and this is where I currently work. So with that, we'll start to talk about um, sarcomas today we'll, we'll briefly discuss the incidence of soft tissue and bone sarcomas and why they are of concern we will talk about some reconstructive options and we will then move on to some case examples and current trends in terms of management of innovations in diagnosis and treatment So uh, talking in terms of sarcomas, they are essentially a heterogeneous group of rare mesenchymal tumors that account for about 1% of all malignancies. They can develop along any of the lines um, of connective tissue derivatives. For example, from a mesenchymal stem cell, we get an adipoblast that leads to formation of fat, but a tumor in this cell line will lead to a liposarcoma. Similarly, a chondroblast, which leads to cartilage formation, can lead to development of chondrosarcoma if the tumor follows those cell lines. And given the heterogeneity of the mesenchymal stem cell, we have numerous malignancies that can follow. And that's why it makes it such a harder group to, to put together. Uh, looking at the burden of uh, soft tissue sarcomas to start with, in the US, it's about 12,000 cases a year. And that accounts for about 3.2 percent, sorry, 3.2 per 100,000 population. So overall, soft tissue sarcomas account for under 1 percent of all new cancer diagnoses in the U.S. There is a slight male preponderance, but overall, it's literally like finding a needle in a haystack. The incidence of soft tissue sarcomas increases with age, as we can see from these graphs here. Uh, th these graphs are from uh, National Cancer Intelligence Network in the UK, and the highest incidence of soft tissue sarcomas are in the sixth and the seventh decade. And again, there is slightly more male uh, preponderance here again. In terms of bone sarcomas, the incidence is even lower in the US. This accounts for about 2,500 cases a year. Overall, it has low mortality, sorry, it has got low survivability and uh, has high mortality rates. When we look at bone sarcomas, these are essentially osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and chondrosarcoma, the three, three most common ones. Of these, 
the Ewing sarc the osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma have a peak incidence in the adolescent age group, as you can see here. And then the osteosarcomas also have a second peak that has a bimodal distribution. So in the sixth and seventh and eighth decade, you can again see increased incidence of osteosarcoma. And uh, chondrosarcoma incidence increases with age and is more common in the sixth and seventh decades. It is interesting to note that over the last 30 years or so, there has not been any significant change in the 10 year survival of primary bone sarcomas. There was a radical change in survival after the introduction of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which became more popular in the early 1980s. But since then, there has not been much change in overall mortality. The overall 10 year survivability for, for osteosarcoma is around the 60 to 65 percent mark whereas there has been marginal improvement in the soft tissue survivability. And what makes it more interesting is that for soft tissue sarcomas, the average size also over the course of the last two to three decades has remained fairly constant. So we looked, did a study in the UK and found that this, the average size of the soft tissue sarcomas at diagnosis is around 10 centimeters. And this has been fairly constant. There has been slight decrease in terms of our earlier diagnosis in Italy and Sweden, but in the UK, it has remained at around that level. What makes uh, bone sarcomas interesting uh, so is, is that when you compare, when you look at um, carcinoma, say breast carcinoma, the survival currently is between 85 to 90 percent overall 10 year survivability. But then, and this has been gradually getting better and better. However, when it look at sarcoma survival, this has not translated into this. And this probably is because it's a very heterogeneous group and there are too many variations in terms of diagnosis. With that, we will move on to reconstructive options following bone sarcoma. So they can be broadly divided into excisions without any reconstruction, such as if you have a lesion in the proximal fibula, you can excise the proximal fibula fairly safely. Uh, the other most common form of reconstruction is endoplastic re reconstruction or EPRs, which happens to be the principal form of reconstruction in the UK for long bone uh, sarcomas, allograft reconstruction with or without a prosthesis, and then amputations. So we'll talk about EPRs. This is the principal reconstruction method followed in the United Kingdom for long bone sarcomas. These are custom implants for most primary sarcoma reconstructions, and they are made from templated long extremity radiographs. These implants are all cemented, and they have a hydroxyapatite or HA collar, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. So what are the advantages of endoplastic replacement? Clearly, it's, it allows for immediate weight bearing and has a very good predictable outcome with 80% MSTS scores in the medium term results. Overall, it has low early complications and these can be readily available. The disadvantages include the cost factor, the increasing risk of complications with time, and overall there's about 10% risk of amputation. And this is usually either secondary to local recurrence of the tumor or from infection. So I'll now take you through a brief example uh, to illustrate how this is carried out. So this is a 17 year old male patient who presented with a lesion in his proximal tibia. It's a sclerotic lesion. On the MRI, you can appreciate the soft tissue component. Imaging features are suggestive of uh, osteosarcoma. The patient first underwent a jump shady needle biopsy. And given the, the dense sclerotic nature of this particular tumor, that was non-diagnostic. So he then underwent an open biopsy, which confirmed high-grade osteosarcoma. So this is his MRI and this is his initial radiograph. In terms of templating and planning, we base a resection of the MRI and, and then we use the T2-weighted images here. We get a long leg standing radiograph to plan and in, uh, design our custom implant. Clearly, resection level is fairly low here and we don't have that much of a intramedullary canal left for the stem. That's why we have incorporated a side plate. This is not 
seen clearly here, but in the post-operative radiographs, you can appreciate that better. In this particular image, you can see the planned incision. This is the open biopsy site. We are incorporating the incision into our final excision. So this is with the skin incision, the flap laid out. And you can see the, bone, the biopsy tract is right here. This is proximal, this is half a spat pad. And this is the completed uh, immediate post-operative radiograph. And you can see this is the side plate I was talking to you earlier about. So this was our implant design of those radiographs. And, uh, and you can see it fits pretty well. And this is a custom implant for this particular patient. So the hydroxyapatite collar philosophy, um, the, the standard implant, so these implants were designed in, in standard, which is now being taken over by Stryker. The standard implant has the advantage of immediate weight bearing owing to stable fixation because of the cement. In the long term, however, we get good bone on growth onto this hydroxyapatite collar present, and that helps with long-term um, fixation of these implants. Essentially, what we do at the time of surgery is we decide the resection level on the bone. What we do is we leave about 5 to 10 millimeters of the periosteum. We peel it back up. We cement the implant, clean the grooves, and then lay the periosteum on top of the HA collar. And in time, we can get bone on growth. So these are this is a retrieved specimen. And uh, essentially, we can see that the bone kind of grows onto these grooves in the hydroxyapatite collar, the HA collar. And this is a microphotograph showing how the bone growth occurs and helps in integration of this implant to the bone. And this is what, this is what provides us long-term stability. So standard implants did play with uh, press with uh, EPRs as well, but they had pretty high rates of aseptic loosening as compared to the cemented EPRs with the HA collar in which patients we saw only about 1.7% aseptic loosening and they had overall 95% survival even at about 19 years. And this took into consideration for both primaries and revisions. The question often asked is, are these custom implants with HA collar the gold standard? Of course, it is a custom implant. It allows for immediate cemented fixation and weight bearing. And in the long term, the HA collar allows for bone on growth and in growth, and that helps for good fixation. Furthermore, revisions also did quite as well as the primaries. But this is an example of a patient who's had this distal femur replacement for about 24 years, and she has done extremely well. This is um, from 2014, this radiograph, and, and she had this implanted when she was 14 and has done well without any loosening up until the last control. And the answer to the question, if this is a gold standard, is no, because infection is still the principal problem. We found that patients who received radiation treatment or had surgery for myeloma or had any further surgery for any reason on that extremity were at higher risk of infection. Pre, uh, prior radiotherapy, myeloma was a highest factor in terms of site. Tibia and pelvis accounted for most infections. We looked at our infections and found that for each year an EPR has been in situ, the risk of spontaneous infection is about 1%. And this risk is cumulative. For example, if a patient has had an implant in for about 15 years, the risk for that patient to develop spontaneous infection is about 15%. Um, incision and drainage or debridement and polychain only works for about 30% of these cases. And a two-stage uh, revision works for about 70% of these patients. Of course, the concern with these patients always is soft tissue cover and other factors such as prior radiation treatment, which might affect soft tissue cover. In order to minimize the risk of infection um, in the UK and in elsewhere, they tried with different surface coatings 
In the UK, we've had some reasonable success with using silver. Uh, Prof. Shishia in Japan was trying uh, iodine coating for implants. He used to call them eye plates and you know uh, eye nails, just like the iPhone. Um, basically, we've had a couple of studies which confirm the benefit of using silver. The first study revealed by Hardis et al. showed that the risk of infection in these EPRs decreased from 18 to 6 percent in the early period in the first two to three years. Uh, our study showed overall infection risk decreased from 22 percent to 12 percent in our retrospective case control study. Not only did silver surface coating help with short-term infection prevention, it also helped improve the success rate for controlling infection in two-stage divisions. So we talked about in our case control study when we looked specifically at tibia and pelvis, etc. We had only about 57% of uh, uh, success with two-stage revisions, and this improved to about 85% with uh, with silver coating. The data also showed better success rate for achieving cure for infection with a DARE procedure. For those of you who are not familiar, DARE procedure is debridement, antibiotics, and implant retention, which can be carried out. So when we have an EPR, which is silver coated, we had success rates with DARE procedure in about 70% of the patients, as opposed to 30% who did not have silver coating. So currently in the UK, all revision endoplastic replacements and primary pelvic and proximal tibial implants are silver coated. The question always comes that is silver cost effective? So what we found that the cost of a single infected endoplastic replacement outweighs the total cost of coating all the implants with silver. For example, this particular patient has a total femur along with the proximal tibia. And the cost of uh, coating this implant with silver is going to be about 600 pounds. And, and uh, a cost of a single infection is well over 20,000 pounds in terms of treatment. With these customized implants, it is of course possible to develop a process for every site, but they don't all work well. The problem with bone sarcomas is our patient demographic. As we saw in the initial slides, the incidence is high in the adolescent age group, and we found that a fair few of our patients are still growing, and therefore we have to accommodate for this. The first generation EPRs were what we called, um, had C collars for growth. Essentially, we jacked them out to length. So essentially what we did was we jacked them out to length and then put an additional block of, of metal in there to maintain the length and position. That was the first generation of what was called as the C collar. The second generation is what is called as a minimally invasive uh, grower. And, and the third generation is currently used, which is a non-invasive grower. It's also uh, called the Stanmore juvenile tumor system. So this is the minimally invasive implant. As you can see, this was developed between, uh, was more common after the mid to uh, mid, late 80s. And essentially what you, you do is under C, you make a stab incision under C-arm control, and then you put this Allen key in, and you can turn the Allen key, which leads to turning of this uh, jack mechanism, and that leads to bone lengthening. It's not a foolproof system. It had some complications as one lengthened spontaneously, and sometimes we had reversal of lengthening or jams. The other big thing, as we talked about, is with every intervention such as lengthening, the risk of infection also increases. So the newer non-invasive non extendable endoplastic replacements are what are currently used. These are expensive. Uh, you can lengthen them by about five millimeters in 20 minutes. Essentially, the implant houses a, a motor with a, with a magnet, and you place this in a, in a coil, electromagnetic coil, which le then leads to turning the motor on, which jacks it out to length. 
The big disadvantage is because of this magnet present, an MRI scan is not it's not MRI compatible, and you need at least 12 centimeters of resection length. So if it's if the resection is too too long, then if it's too short, then you cannot use a grower. And this is the the motor, the gearbox. This is the magnet, and this is essentially the design of that motor, which is placed housed inside the implant. And when it is placed in this electromagnetic coil, it lends, leads to lengthening. And as I said, it's about five millimeters of length in about 20 minutes. It is completely non-invasive and patients love it. Allografts historically uh, in the United Kingdom were not very acceptable for one reason or the other. So they did look at various other reconstructive options. And one of those options they looked at was reimplantation of bone. So this is an interesting concept in that it uses patient's own bone. What you do is once you excise the tumor, you clean the tumor off the bone and then you sterilize it. They tried various variety of sterilizing it, such as autoclaving it, pasteurizing it, um, or you, including microwaving it. But currently this particular series, we used radiation treatment and that worked well. Um, it almost acts like an allograft without the complications of compatibility and has slightly less lower incidence of problems with as compared to allografts. But this is an example. It's called extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation. This patient has chondrosarcoma, as you can see here. This is a whole lesion. The patient had resection of of uh, this was a P1, so this is ilia, ilium, and then we excise up to here, P2, P3 combined resection, and we clean the bone of the tumor, sterilize the bone, and then we re-implanted patient's own bone and re reattached it along with the hip replacement. Now, the reason why hip replacement is needed because all the cartilage dies off and it won't have any structural stability. That's why we, we put a cemented hip replacement in this patient. This is a further example. So this is a high-grade sarcoma of the tibia. The tibial lesion was resected. The tumor is cleaned out. Uh, in this particular patient, we used the hot dog technique. I'll come to that in a second. Basically, we cut out a window in the back of the, the tibia and we'll wedge the ipsilateral fibula, vascularized fibula into this. So once we excise it, we wrap the bone once it's been cleaned off all the tumor. And then this box is irradiated. It's sent for the radiation to the radiation department for high dose radiation. And when we get it back, we did our bone graft. So we moved the ipsilateral fibula along with the bone that, was, that we came back. And then this is the two year end result with this particular patient. Of course, navigation is the key nowadays. We talk a lot about navigated joint replacements and robotic joint replacement. Um, navigation did make its way into orthopedic oncology as well. Um, especially in the pelvis, this has shown to be substantially better in terms of decreasing the overall incidence of local recurrence. Lee Jays and all uh, published this uh, decreased incidence of uh, local recurrence following navigated pelvic resection. So essentially what we do is uh, we can overlap the MRI and CT, and as we can see in this particular patient, we can plan a resection levels based on the tumor mapping on the software. We can, with improvement in 3D printing technologies, we can put the implant back in place. So we can design a custom implant for this specific patient. So we are looking at our cuts here. It gives you, and then you can overlap our three-dimensional implant, the 3D printed implant in here. This was the excise specimen, and this is a 3D printed implant for this patient. And then this was the final images, as you can see, this is a custom 3D in printed implant here. And then we have a cemented total hip into this. Now moving on to allograft reconstructions. So this is the main form of reconstruction in the US and American subcontinents. Um, surprisingly, Argentina is one of the, those countries which has a very advanced system of bone banking. And what they do essentially is all the donor bone is mapped and undergoes CT-based measurements. And based on these measurements, all the dimensions and parameters such as transepicondylar axis for distal femur, medial 
condyle measurements and lateral condyle measurements are all uploaded onto a database. And when there's a need for an allograft, what they do is they match the donor parameters with the host parameters and see what uh, allograft will fit the patient the best. This is an example of it. So the, this is the tumor which needs to be resected. They're mapping from the allograft bank which one will fit well. So this is a resected tumor and this is the allograft. And you can see it fits. This is the best fit allograft that they could find in their tumor bank. So this is one way that they're utilizing allograft reconstructions. Prof Shishida in Kanazawa, he has been popularizing the pedicle frozen autograft reconstruction technique. So he combines this interestingly with his technique of caffeine mediated chemotherapy. Now, this is this comes with a disclaimer. The caffeine mediated chemotherapy has not worked in centers outside his. Uh, essentially, he states to, to get about consistent 99% um, tumor necrosis with IV caffeine mediated chemotherapy. Uh, it's interesting because in Japan, the orthopedic oncologist administer the chemotherapy, unlike the trends in the rest of the world where a medical oncologist looks after the chemotherapy part of the, the whole uh, treatment and the orthopedic oncologist deals with the reconstructive side of stuff. So essentially in a pedicle uh, frozen autograph reconstruction technique, for example, if this is the tumor, we, we res carry out the section as we would for the tumor and as we saw in extracorporeal uh, radiation technique, we clean out the tumor, uh, we seal this, the patient's soft tissues, and then he dips the bone into liquid nitrogen for about 20 minutes. And then this is irrigated out for another 20 minutes. And then you use a bone cement or, or hardware to fix it back. So it's almost similar to extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation technique. This is a further example, the tumor in the proximal femur. Here, this is the whole resection. This is the sealing of the patient's tissues uh, to prevent cold burns. And then you dip it into liquid nitrogen, you wash the, the bone out, and then you, uh, for proximal femur, we always do a, a implant. So this is a long stem hemi, arthroplasty carried out as a further reconstruction along with pedicle frozen autograft. Moving on to some soft tissue sarcoma examples. Uh, this is one of my patients. Uh, he had a high grade of uh, liposarcoma in the vastus intermedius. This measured about 26 centimeters by 14 by 14 centimeters. You can see the vascular structures right here. You can see the tumor wrapped around the bone, the femur. Uh, sarcomas are usually tend to respect facial planes and periosteum acts like a good barrier for tumor spread. In this particular patient, the bone was uninvolved. So this is the, the resection specimen. So pretty much took out almost 80% of his quad muscle. Um, so this is the biopsy tract that was excised. And here we can see the periosteum from the front. So this was a neoadjuvant um, resection. So patient had preoperative radiation treatment. We waited for about six weeks after the radiation, and then we then excised the tumor. So what that leads to is, is it's a double hit to the bone. We all know that the proximal femur is a site for maximal stresses in the, in the lower extremity, uh, and hence this bone is going to fracture because one, it has had high dose radiation, and two, uh, I have excised the periosteum as my deep margin. So this bone does not have any remodeling potential. So the question is not if it is gonna fracture, the question is when it is gonna fracture. Usually the incidence of these fractures is highest around the two year mark. So about a year post-operatively, I plan to stabilize his femur. Uh, because of the size of the tumor, I needed uh, MRI scans to, to look at um, tumor surveillance. And what I did was I used a carbon fiber, uh, I'm cephalometry nail here for this patient. And this is the immediate post-operative x-rays following the carbon fiber nailing. 
and this shows there's minimal scatter following the, um, uh, the snailing technique and uh, I could get pretty good MRI scans to follow to maintain surveillance and as I said the bone will fracture it's, it's not a question of uh, if it's a question of when so about two and a half years down the road he did fracture his femur but the implant did the job it was designed to do and it held the bone together we'll see a lot of interesting reconstructions in sarcomas this is a, a patient in her 20s who had ewing sarcoma high grade as you can see this involved pretty much whole of the thigh compartment we had good response to chemotherapy we decided to do a rotation plasty for the patient we excised pretty much most of the thigh compartment this is her sciatic nerve and the femoral artery which is intact here preserved and then this is what we did uh, if you pay a closer attention yes this is rotation plasty but what we did was because we took out the whole of the femoral compartment what we did was we placed a hip replacement stem into the tibia it is rotation plasty and you can appreciate the fibula being a medial structure now in terms of amputations uh, I'm not going to specifics of amputations, but some of new trends is work on what we call an ITAP type prosthesis. ITAP stands for intraarches transcutaneous amputation prosthesis. Essentially, the there's a stem which is implanted into the bone and it projects out of the skin, and this clicks into a custom prosthesis. This has shown to decrease the energy requirements in older patients with high amputations like this one. These patients can get back to working as a farmer or using a tractor and things like that because this decreases the energy expenditure expenditure so is this the future there are some challenges with these um, just like with any pin tract infection we see with frames and ilizaro etc there's there are issues with colonization and discharge at the skin and implant interface So what else is new in, in, in terms of uh, sarcomas? We are now relying more and more on, on genetic markers for both soft tissue sarcomas and bone sarcomas. Some of the common ones is MDM2 for liposarcoma. We're using even for benign tumors such as TAC6 for solitary fibrous tumor, a TLE1 for synovial sarcoma, et cetera. We found genetic markers for bone lesions as well, both um benign and malignant for example we're looking at cdk4 and mdm2 amplifications osteosarcoma we're looking at cd99 and o13 markers in ewing sarcoma we've identified genetic mutation h3f3 for aneurysmal bone cyst so we are working and these is making a, the diagnosis diagnosis a little bit less challenging but still we have a long way to go so for those who are interested, this is a, a comprehensive list of common genetic translocations that can be identified. Um, for example, we can at Ewing sarcoma T uh, translocation 1122 EWS FLI1 FL1 is the most common translocation. So, so this is a whole comprehensive list of the genetic translocations. It is sometimes tested uh, in, in uh, FRCS and uh, step ones in uh, US boards as well. So for those who are interested, can look at and refer to this comprehensive table. In terms of further trends, um, foundation one. So basically we are now moving towards uh, a precision medicine system. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify more comprehensive uh, gene, genetic material in the tumor cells and seeing if there is any relevant mutations for which we have targeted treatments. So foundation one is one such system. Basically what it does is it looks at uh, 324 genes or for cancer relevant mutations. And, and what we do is we profile them. It's more common for advanced cancers such as lung cancers. You can find a mutation, say this particular patient has EGFR mutation and it also lists out what therapies may be available and what trials are currently in progress so that's where 
we are moving towards more biological treatments and targeted agents based on these mutations. So the it shows, as I said, it shows what FDA approved therapies are available, if there's any, what trials are going on and potential clinical trials based on those mutations. Some of the newer drugs for benign diseases, I mean, denosumab has been uh, invoked for some time, especially for giant cell tumors of the bone. The newer one is a colony stimulating factor 1R kinase inhibitor for GCT of tendon sheet. Uh, this is a pexidatinib. So I'm not going to mechanism of action of denosumab, but essentially it inhibits uh, the, the rankle and helps with significant downsizing. So this is a preoperative rate image, pre-denosumab image, and then post-denosumab, it allows for downsizing and allows for less morbid surgical procedures and joint preservation. The downside is there are a lot of uh, unknowns such as possible malignant transformation. How long do we need to give the treatment for these medications have long half-lives and we don't know long-term complications of use of, with these. Um, similarly, the newer one is for GCT of tendon sheet or PVNS. This is a commonly, commonly uh, stimulating factor 1R receptor kinase inhibitor. Uh, again, this has decreased need for mutilating surgeries. All in all, uh, the single most important thing to improve survival for patients with sarcoma is early diagnosis. My only advice for all trainees would be that any lump which is bigger than the size of a golf ball, so approximately five centimeters in size, if it is deep to the deep tissue, painless and growing, then please get some imaging before planning on excision. Don't blindly go in. It makes things a lot worse if you inadvertently and do unplanned excision of soft tissue mass or, or tumor. All in all, with all these newer developments, sarcoma diagnosis does not always equate to this, okay? Uh, there's a lot of reconstructive options. We are making progress and we get there. Thank you. So this is a, this is a night view of our University of Cincinnati sports uh, complex in, in, in the university. Thank you so much. Thank you, Krishna. Fantastic lecture. And you have touched upon all the major global trends in oncology. Thank you, Tish. A few questions. Now, someone wants to know what is an allograft prosthetic composite? And do you have experience in how, is, how does it go in? Okay, so essentially what happens is, say, if, if there's a lesion in the proximal uh, proximal femur, and, you, and you're using an allograft, so the, the allograft femoral head is not strong enough to withstand all the stresses. So what we do is we use the uh, allograft bone for the proximal femur, but then we put in a hip replacement into the allograft. So it's a combination of an allograft combined with an implant, and, and, and uh, that gives us the additional stability without the risk of the femoral head collapsing in the short term and things like that. Thank you for that. So that and uh, no. you showed a fantastic image of a carbon fiber implant, right? So do you think that is going to be the trend for oncology fixations? Because the advantage of you get a beautiful MR if you want later. I don't think so. I I, I think cost is a factor. It is expensive. Uh, there are improvements in uh, MRI technology as well. So a lot of places have metal artifact reduction sequence MRI. Um, I did not, our facility does not have the ability to do a mass sequence or metal artifact reduction sequence. And that's why I, I opted to to get a carbon fiber implant for my patient because pretty much given the size of his lesion, which was about 26 centimeters in size, I needed to have a close surveillance with that being so close to the bone. So that's why I opted for him, but it won't be my go-to implant. So to, if I can help it, uh, probably not, but it just depends on the site and location. They have plates, so th there are trials going on which is looking at uh, carbon fiber plates and, and, and screw fixation versus traditional metal uh, plates and screws uh, to see because the modulus of elasticity is closer to bone. Therefore, there may be some stress shielding benefits from these carbon fiber implants. But right now, the cost is inhibitive. 
Thank you, Krishna, for that. And the other question is, there's a lot of tendency for magnetic controlled rods, right? For example, in the spine, there's magnetic controlled growing rods. And similarly, like you said, in the knee, I mean, the reconstruction in, in, of yeah. endoprocesses. So do you think that is going to be the gold standard? Because avoidance of a intraoperative surgery, I mean, you can do it as an OPD procedure, isn't it? Right, that's correct. And a lot of the times the procedure is done by the physical therapist, so they can just put the coil and if they once they're trained, they can they can do the lengthening. So that is the advantage. So US traditionally for has been uh, in some sense uh, anti uh, EPRs, um, but then the Stanmer implant, the growing implant, it's, it's, they've labeled it as the juvenile tumor system. So that has the FDA approval. So so I, th I think yes, uh, distal femur, I think pretty much everywhere, the growing implant probably is the way forward. There's slightly higher in uh, incidence of infection with the growing implant. We don't know exactly why that is. Uh, maybe because there are moving parts and that leads to some more colonization. I mean, we're not entirely sure. So we do code. The so silver is not FDA approved. So it can't be used in the, uh, in the US setting, but elsewhere they do tend to coat them with silver. So I think, yes, there is a way towards that. Um, again, infection does, with all these EPRs, infection is always a big concern. Thank you, Krishna. Just one last question before we wind up. It's sure. actually a basic question. Suppose someone presents with a pathological fracture. So how do you decide whether you're going to fix it or are you going to do a replacement? <laughs> great, great, great question. So, so we looked at uh, some of uh, the data. So essentially what we were doing earlier was uh, if somebody had, say, for example, a metastatic uh, uh, femoral neck fracture, we'll try to put in a long stem implant to kind of bridge the bone as, as much as we can. Uh, these patients always kind of end up needing uh, uh, adjuvant treatment, so either radiation treatment, chemotherapy, et cetera. So we have to assume that the bone is not going to heal or or is limited potential to heal. Uh, we recently just got up one of our papers accepted uh, with my partners in, in Turkey, uh, essentially looking at healing of long bones following. Uh, so the, the, to back to your question, I'm just going to wind back a second. Uh, the, the, the traditional point is we have to assume that the bone does not have the potential to heal completely. So either you, if you're fixing it or so, if you're fixing it, then you're going to fix it in such a way, assuming that the bone is not going to heal. So you put in an implant, but you're going to augment it with using some cement. So you can use a rod, you can use a plate, but you augment, you augment using some cement to hold the whole construct together uh, so that the patient can have further treatments such as radiation, et cetera. Um, in terms of replacement or doing an endoprosthetic replacement for, for a metastatic lesion, it just depends on what the life expectancy and outcome of the patient is. Um, if a patient has a metastatic disease and only say, for example, patient has breast cancer and there's one isolated solitary bone metastasis, then you need to be aggressive and aggressive in treatment of both the primary as well as the bone sarcoma, uh, the bone metastasis. And you're going to treat the bone metastasis uh, with almost as if it's a sarcoma. So you go aggressive, you can replace it and then treat it adjuvantly. And these patients tend to have much better overall long-term survival and function as opposed to somebody who has only three months of life expectancy, for example, has multiple sites of metastasis, those patients, it does not make sense to do, a, a, say, a proximal femur endoplastic replacement because they won't have enough time to rehab from it and it's going to slow them down. Thank you, Krishna. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Fantastic lecture, really cutting edge, and I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Hitesh. Uh, one other point, uh, Hitesh, I'm going to circulate this. Uh, we are holding a webinar on, on the 10th of April uh, with my, uh, so I have, so, so one of the best parts of doing the oncology uh, job is that you make friends everywhere across the world. I have some close friends in Turkey and Italy, and we have put together a, a webinar for trainees and everybody else. Basically, it's an update on bone metastasis. So we're going to cover a lot of those, the last question that you asked on it. Uh, it's a free webinar to join. It's on 10th of April, and uh, I'll, I'll forward you the, the details. It, um, I think it will be a great resource. Thank you so Thank much. You.